The li- I get this all the time. Well, who's the biggest in the world? Yeah, that's a fair question. If you talk about geographic area covered, as far as physically hands-on going in and taking a donkey out of a bad situation, I'm going to take that one because we've worked from the Canadian border in Washington State to the southern tip of Florida to Kona, Hawaii. Um, next month, I'm, when I'm up here for a donkey mule show, I'm doing a rescue in Connecticut. So I, I, I dare say we've got the map covered. Um, as far as how many donkeys, who cares for the most, I don't know. I, I think I read something that the UK claims they have about uh, 2,800. Yeah. So who knows? We've got 32. As far as UK goes, they definitely do more in a bigger room. They send vets down into third world countries and stuff, so that they kind of got that end covered. But we're pretty damn big. So to be big, you got to have good people. We'll get rid of them guys. And I've got the very best people. Everybody with their feet on the ground is full time, and they all have a division that they operate. And the two guys up in the truck have worked for me since high school, and they're both in college, so they they cover the weekends. Uh, yeah, most of mine are underneath the truck. <laughs> Try driving down the, the highway and in the clown car here, you get a lot of looks. <laughs> uh, these are some of our satellite adoption center operators. Again, we, besides our, our paid employees in Texas, we have a network of hundreds of volunteers that help adopt our donkeys out, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Our rescue, we have these two transport teams, each can haul 30 donkeys at a time, and we can be anywhere in the country within pretty much 48 hours. So emergencies aren't that big of a deal. We're usually running at least two transport teams at any one time. We have other trucks and trailers, but these, these are the big ones. You'll notice that this one is the clown car. This one's unmarked. That's because when you're working with law enforcement and you have to go into some meth head's house and take his donkey, you don't want him to know who you are. Um, we kind of have two of everything because we have to have tractors to feed. We, we have 1,200 donkeys, give or take, right now on our main ranch. And so we've, everything's done on a tractor, and tractors break down, so we can't be without it. So we have two all the time, and they both get used pretty much full time. At our ranch, we have two different sets of, this, this is a cattle management system that's been adapted to, to work well with donkeys. And we have one on one side of the ranch and one on the other side of the ranch, and this is what we do for everything from hoof trimming, vaccinations, deworming, most medical things that we do like I said, when we do something, we, we keep donkeys in a group of about 100. So when we deworm one of the, one of the herds, one of the paddocks, we're going to go through 100 of them. So we, we're, we're really good at assembly lining things, whether it's hoof trimming, whatever it is, we, we get the job done. This is the other one. This one's actually indoors. Uh, narrow them down is the main thing because donkeys can turn on a dime. And then those minis that you saw, we had to build it down even further. This is our, our, our custom-made tilt squeeze. And I don't know why the picture's in black and white. I don't know if I was in artistic mood or what, but this is the only one I could find of the whole thing. So there's your art for the day. And there's old Butch looking at me. Uh, and this is, this is Zach trimming the hose. And you can see that we, we don't have to squeeze them down real tight but we tie their legs so they can't pull them up. And we can do, do a donkey start to finish. And these are very hard to ma- manage donkeys, OK? You're going to meet the farrier here in a minute. But the, these, these are the really difficult to handle donkeys that we use this for. And so we're able to do, in under 20 minutes, an unmanageable animal. And it's less stress. It's, it's better than sedating them and having them get back up. So we get them in, we get them out, and everybody's better. Here's Jack, who runs the ranch. And this is, this is Tink, the one we showed you as x-ray. And you can see that's the bottom of his foot, the way the crowd flesh has kind of come down around it and made that pad. It was still very sensitive. But he, he still had to walk on that until we got him. We, we changed his dressing daily until he got his prosthetic. And now we're easing him into the prosthetic. But this is our, I guess the point was, this is one of our medical bays here, indoor medical bays. It's heated and lit. There he is. There's Tink with his new prosthetic. 
And this is the overall view of the ranch. We are experts at large herd management. It ain't bragging if you can back it up, Grandpa said. So we're really good at what we do. You'll notice everything's labeled, and that's because we all travel. And so when you call another staff member, that person could be anywhere in the country. And so if you say, you know that one donkey that's gray and it's got the big ears, and he's over in that one pin, you know, kind of by that other donkey, and you say, no, what are you talking about? So this is the first thing all new employees learn is all the different paddocks. This is a former dairy. This right here is the milking barn. And so all these paddocks are interconnected alleyway to get up in there, which makes it really convenient when we have to feed the skinnies or you know, treat them for anything. And this is where one of the cattle management systems is. But this, we have about 110 acres in grazing that we were fortunate enough because we had a mild winter that we were able to graze all winter long our winter wheat. Hay barn, this is the, the, the barn that had the second cattle, cattle management system. And so pretty decent property. Uh, it, it, 1,200 donkeys on a piece of property sounds like a lot, but donkeys aren't like horses or cattle. They, they just don't require it. So we, we, we try to limit these paddocks to about 100 donkeys per, but we could literally triple that, and it really wouldn't be that big a deal. But hundreds easier to manage at one time than more than that. Our care and feeding, this is a, one of the things we do is to try to prevent future donkeys needing to be rescued. This is the, I guess it's the third edition. Um, we, we mail them, they're set up so people can mail them anonymously to their neighbor, you know, things like that. But we're kind of trying to get the head of it. Quarantine. We don't know any history on the donkeys that we get. We show up and they get in the trailer and we bring them home. And so quarantine is very, very important. We're currently trying to build a new quarantine facility, a little more state-of-the-art, because what happens now is, let's say 20 donkeys come in from uh, McClellan County, and they start the quarantine period. And then 50 donkeys come in from up in Cisco. Well, there's no way I can quarantine that many without those two groups coming in contact. So guess what? That first group starts its clock all over again so that they can all come out at the same time. And that's it, because if we start breaking those policies and we get one thing in a herd of 100 that then touches nose with the next herd of 100, I've got an epidemic. And so we have to be very careful on how, how we manage those types of things. How long do you need to quarantine? Three weeks. This is that big mini rescue. This is us processing them. And this is the little extra addition we had to put in. I'm not a fan of mini donkeys. I'm six foot four, and that's a long way to get down on the ground and spend the day on your knees. Uh, here we were, we were processing them, and we'll talk about that. But basically, when we, when we in, intake donkeys, they get a microchip, they get dewormed, they get a seven-way with West Nile vaccine that's boosted later, and then they're given just an overall, put your hands on them, make sure they've got teeth and four legs and the whole thing. And interesting enough about the four legs, we had rounded up these miniatures, we had transported them to the ranch, we had given them a week and a half of the gins to kind of chill before we molested them, and we found that one of them only had three legs. So that's what we do. Oh, there she is right there. Yeah, it wasn't until we actually got her in the chute that we, and we were counting hooves and we're like, hmm. But she's got her new prosthetic now too. All right, caring for the animals that are in our care. It's a lot of work because, again, we're trying to maintain health. Here is our aforementioned farrier, Richard Bruner, my favorite person in the world, because trying to find people that trim donkeys' hooves is almost impossible. Trying to find somebody that will trim untrained donkeys' hooves is impossible. Uh, he comes every month, spends at least two days, and trims 100 donkeys per day. He does not use a rasp, a hoof pick, or a hoof knife. And he's got four videos on our YouTube channel that I would encourage you to watch because even if you never, that's not true. A lot of vets get suckered into trimming donkeys because they can't, the, the owners can't find farriers to do it. And so you might find yourself underneath a donkey trimming it. Watch Richard Bruner and the way he handles it. He doesn't stress the animal. He doesn't cowboy the animal. 
eight. It's amazing. That's all I can say. He, there's four videos, and it's amazing to watch this man work. Uh, he'll be at the, the symposium this October doing a demonstration, so if you all are around, come by and see him. He is just mind-blowing. We feed around 12,000 pounds of hay every day, and that's based on we have 1,200 donkeys. Average donkey is 500 pounds, 2 pounds a day, 10 pounds per donkey. Um, and because our, we do have some mammoths and we do have some minis, it's a little bit more than they need, but we always err on the side of too much. We feed 800 pounds of uh, fresh grass and grain per day, and we'll get into that fresh grass stuff. But uh, as you can tell, this ain't a cheap business to be in. This is the aforementioned green grass. This is our hydroponics room that serves two purposes. One, it generates 250 pounds of fresh rye grass every single day, and that's a seven-day process. And there's a really cool video on our YouTube channel if you're at all interested. So that's process one, is getting fresh food to these donkeys that are malnourished. And what we do is, I'm scared of this thing now. This is the rolls, the, the trays are six foot wide, 10 inches, or 10 inches wide, but six feet deep. And so these are the rolls that we take, and there's a big chopper thing. We put them in and it shreds it into coleslaw. And it's really a cool process, so if you're all interested in hydroponics. The second purpose of the room is in West Texas, they don't give a damn about donkeys. These are West Texas ranchers and farmers. They could care less. But drought-resisting farming, that's interesting. So I get a bunch of these old cowboys out. If you look at that, and you can assure you, I, I put my arm around him and steer him out to the donkeys and say, hey, look at all this too, cowboy. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a reason to get people to come out and actually visit us was this room. So it's a pretty cool video, so if you're interested, check it out. And then castrations. We castrate everything that has two of them. Well, even if they only have one at the time, we, we just take them in the clinic. But we castrate pretty much everything but the really, really old wild ones that, that don't show any tendency of being jacks. I, I won't waste your time, but in, in, in wild burrows, the groups are matriarchal. Okay, so you'll see uh, Jins with her Jeanette offspring. They have babies. The jacks get kicked out around a year. They form bachelor groups. They all live their lives, and that kind of, that's a natural way of preventing inbreeding. Well, when the jacks get past that breeding age and they're no longer viable, they'll return to a matriarchal group for protection. So if they've hit that age, then we don't castrate them, and we usually try to put them out on sanctuary and just let them be old, grouchy donkeys. These are two fourth years from Texas A&M that were out last week or week before last, uh, learning proper procedures. And when, when they came out, they had never castrated a donkey, and by the time they left, they had all done at least 20, I think. Yeah. Yeah, when we cut, we cut a lot. Uh, here's another picture of the students. And if you all don't mind, I want to show you a little testimonial video that the students did after coming out. Uh, my name is Luke Duckworth. Uh, this is my second week as a fourth year student. So just finished with the books two weeks ago, took my last final, and then um, this is my second week on clinics. So I'm, I'm on food animal field services, um, but we elected to come out here and help out with the castrations. Howdy, my name is Amanda Martinez. Um, I'm a fourth year veterinary student as of two weeks ago. <laughs> okay, I'm Ashley Gaston. So I'm pretty much finishing up my fourth year. Um, I'm actually uh, from Ross University. I went to school in the Caribbean and I was placed at Texas A&M University. I started in September and I should be finishing up this August. Hi, my name's Jennifer Goodwin. It's, I went to undergrad at Texas State in San Marcos and then I got into vet school. And so now I'm in College Station. I'm in my fourth year. Really excited. Um, so prior to today, I've only helped with two equine castrations. Um, and then that was even before vet school started. And then you get into vet school and um, our first year we studied like anatomy and normal physiology and then our second year we're studying disease and then your third year you're studying medicine and then finally you're here and you're like, man, this is like what I've been working for. And to come out here and to be able to use these facilities um, and be 
trained by the doctors that we have, the boarded surgeons, is just incredible. Um, at school, we see a lot of things like this too, but you might only get to help with one um, or just observe. But when you're like out here actually um, doing these in a controlled setting, as controlled as it can be, like um, it's realistic and you can't stimulate that in any other kind of environment. And so um, just extremely fortunate to be able to come out here, um, work with uh, the Peace Valley Ranch and being able to, you just, it's not a habit per se, but you just get comfortable um, and you, the more you do, the more you see and you're like, okay, well, you know, I, I just had one that was bleeding a little bit more and I need to go in and find out what's bleeding. And those are things that you learn about and you know you're supposed to do, but you just can't learn it other than actually doing it out here. Um, and so really fortunate to be able to come out here um, and just get some real applicable um, real-time experience. It's been incredible. I hadn't done any horse or donkey castrations in the past. I've only observed um, and the, I did five today and the experience was really amazing and I don't think I would have gotten this from watching a video of how to do it or from any sort of model and I feel pretty confident about going out on, in the field um, alone doing one on a horse, on a client, on a horse or donkey. So, um, donk for donkeys, I'd say yesterday was my first time doing a donkey castration. Um, since yesterday, I think I've done about, I'd say about 30. My confidence level, um, it's gotten a lot better. Um, at first, it's always, with everything new that you do, it, what keeps you from feeling a little confident is just the unknown and the unfamiliarity. And the more you do it, the more familiar you um, get to it and you don't even have to think about what you're doing sometimes. Um, I'd say my confidence has been a lot, it's a lot higher now that I've done a lot more. I haven't done any castrations prior to today or yesterday. And I think I've done anywhere from 10 to 15, probably about 15 total. And it's just been an amazing experience. It makes me really excited to become a veterinarian because we spend three years in, in sitting in classrooms learning about things that you know we should eventually see sometime in our career. And it's really good to get hands-on experience. And I really enjoyed getting this experience. It's something we'll never have in, in, in school, for sure. Bef prior to today, like I was comfortable with the process of the procedure, like knowing the steps um, and then today like I feel comfortable like I could I could go out as a licensed veterinarian in a couple in a couple months and and do this comfortably knowing that I wasn't going to put the animal in danger like I was I was going to do what needed to be done um, and you know our, our rule is do no harm so I, I can comfortably say that doing this now with this experience I would do no harm um, to something in the future and it, that's something that I couldn't have said before today um, and so like I'm really thankful for being able to come out here and and gain that comfort level um, because of my experience today. Um, it's definitely boosted my confidence significantly from sitting in a classroom and reading it out of a book and coming out here and actually using my own hands and experience and my knowledge, putting my knowledge into practice and you know things that you can't learn out of a book you learn being out here and being able to actually do it with your you know by yourself too and kind of getting in that situation where no one else is going to help you, you got to get it done type thing. Um, yeah, I, um, I would not have been, I will not, I would not be as confident as I am now if I hadn't gone here and done this castration project. Well, I signed up for it maybe a couple of weeks ago and then um, to come on this trip and I knew we were going to be castrating so I read a chapter in a book and I was like, okay, sounds like I can do this and you know, we, we watched a few and I was like, okay, now I really think like get my hands in there and it's just a, a 360 degree learning process for sure. Um, yeah, I definitely feel after this experience I could definitely go out on my own and talk to a client and know what drugs I need to use and you know, get the job done, get them down, tie them up and do the whole process and make a, make a happy client. Um, I've, I've really been praying about this and thinking about it and after I graduate I want to do just large animal ambulatory. I want to work out of a truck so this is something that I would be doing a lot of coming out to farms where they may have too many animals to load up and bring to a clinic or they may not have a trailer um, but I just really feel like being mobile in a truck is where I can really meet the people um, and I, I've always said like I'm coming to veterinary school because I love animals but also because I love people and I can service these people and help them through their animals and so it, it's the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, I'd like to be mobile in a truck, um, just going out and doing farm calls. Um, and so this is 
like this is what I want to do when I get done. Also with, with cattle and, and other food animal species, but um, this is like this is what I came to school for. So it's been it's been fascinating today. So when I graduate, I plan on being a mixed practice veterinarian, so doing both small and large animals. I have never seen this many donkeys before in one spot, and I think it's a great thing that these people are doing to be able to do this and have us out here to take care of them and everything like that. So I'm very grateful for the experience. So um, my interests are surgery, and so that's why I felt like today was pretty fun. Um, I'm actually more small animal oriented. Uh, my father is a small animal companion um, general practitioner, and I've got a lot of experience with him, and I plan to um, join him in the future. But I also plan to do an internship um, and also hopefully get a surgical residency, small animal surgery residency. Um, that's my, that's my um, plan so far. I really just want to work at a mixed animal practice. I love dogs and cats and horses and cows and now donkeys. Um, I also, you know, I like exotic pets too, so I'm interested in pretty much everything. So mixed animal practice kind of is everything I would want. Well, growing up I used to ride horses and I'd, I've never really uh, been around donkeys before and I think they're they're very sweet they each have their own unique bray and um, I think they're they're really wonderful creatures and I'm glad that we were able to come out and and help them you know eventually maybe get adopted or you know live a better life well that's all for now a big thank you to the staff and students of Texas A&M Veterinary School along with Dr. Eric Davis and his wife Cindy Please remember that Peaceful Valley is supported entirely through private donations. Please go to our website, donkeyrescue.org, and make a donation. While you're there, get a coffee cup or a t-shirt from the gift shop. Y'all be good, and we'll see you next time. Dogs, let's go. So, anyway, as you can tell, very beneficial. And that video helped restore the program because A&M pulled the plug on it. We were doing it twice a year, and they said, oh, the kids just aren't getting anything from it. So this, this helped prove otherwise.